Happy Friday and welcome back to Brain Scratch. I'm John Borden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today as we dive into one of the most perplexing cases of this year. I received an email several weeks ago from someone saying that they had a childhood friend who had been murdered. And that friend's family were very worried that they weren't going to receive proper justice. Now, we're talking about a case where we have an eyewitness. We've got a confession. I mean, quite honestly, we have all the pieces that this should roll right through the court system. But we're now talking about this five years later, and that still hasn't happened yet. What's going on with this case? Let's learn much more about it by starting with the sources and learning where this takes place. Thousand Oaks, California, actually a place somewhat near and dear to my heart. I would say about 25 years ago, uh, I lived in this area. And back then it was known for being one of the safest areas. It would constantly come up on those top 10 lists of safest communities. I think it had even hit one of the safest communities in the nation. But let's learn a little bit more about Thousand Oaks. Thousand Oaks is a city in the northwestern part of greater Los Angeles. It's approximately 15 miles from the city of Los Angeles. It's the second largest city in Ventura County, and it's named after the many oak trees present in the area. The population was over 126,000 at the 2020 census. And when I lived there, I lived in an apartment condo very, very similar to the one we're seeing pictured here. Um, but we can also see that there is police tape up around this. What happened at this condo? Let's jump into the article, starting with the Ventura County Star. Sheriffs investigating homicide. Uh, and this is May 28th, 2018. That would be Memorial Day. It was kind of in the early morning hours at the start of Memorial Day. Thousand Oaks police are investigating the city's second homicide of the year after a 26-year-old man was found dead early Monday. Deputies first responded to a call of a disturbance shortly after 1 a.m. at the Casa de Oaks condominiums on Megan Place in the city of Thousand Oaks. When deputies arrived on the scene, they found the dead man and a 27-year-old woman with serious injuries. Now, some of you are probably thinking, okay, that's that's our witness. Mm. In part, yes, but not quite. Let's continue with more details here from an article the following day. Thousand Oaks resident Chad Amelia was found dead sometime after 1.15 a.m. He was found with multiple wounds. A 27-year-old woman was also found at the scene suffering from major injuries. She was taken to a local hospital and was listed in stable condition. Amelia lived in the condo where he was found. Uh, I believe there was also two roommates of his. This woman is not one of those roommates. Investigators interviewed two males who were in the condo at the time of the incident, but they were not believed to have been involved, authorities said. The investigation is ongoing, but investigators are not looking for any outstanding suspects, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office said. An examination of Omelia to determine a cause and manner of death was being conducted by the Ventura County Medical Examiner's Office. So I've told you we've got a witness, basically an eyewitness in this case. It's very interesting that early on the Sheriff's Department is putting out, we're not looking for a suspect. Like, yes, this is a murder. Yes, it seems like two people have been injured, but we're not looking for a suspect. This is Chad. Uh, let's learn a little bit more about him from some information that his friend shared with me. Uh, he says that Chad was always smiling, and of the pictures I'm seeing, I could see that. Uh, I also went looking through newspapers.com for articles about Chad, and I was surprised at how many times his name came up, uh, in particular in regards to sports. It seems to be someone that really loved sports, but back to his friend's comments. He was a super he was super respectful. I don't think I ever met a more polite person. He had a joyous personality that made everyone laugh. Um, I do have a picture of him a bit younger here uh, playing football. Um, he was a huge sports enthusiast. He played different sports from little league to high school. He loved Notre Dame's football team. He was proud of his Irish heritage. He visited multiple times in his life. He always wanted to be an accountant. Not sure why, but that's what he wanted. We all teased him for it, but he stayed true to his passion. He set his mind to do it, and he was able to make it happen. He wasn't a perfect person. No one is, but he definitely deserves justice. He deserves more eyes and ears on his story. 
Uh, and thank you to the friend for sharing that and much more um, research and all kinds of stuff that helped bring today's episode together and is going to bring a very big question and literally drop it in all of our laps. Uh, but let's continue with the details here and see if we can figure out what happened on this night. Over at the Simi Valley Acorn, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office is remaining mostly mum over details of a Monday morning homicide in Thousand Oaks. After releasing the name of the deceased, 26-year-old Chad Amelia, the department, which is still investigating the homicide, declined to give the nature of the man's death or name a suspect. A sheriff's spokesperson said the department is confident there is no killer on the prowl, however. This is not one of those where we have someone dangerous on the loose, Sheriff's Department spokesperson Garo Koregian said. Let's continue over at scvnews.com. Ventura County Sheriff's deputies responded to reports of a disturbance on Megan Place in Thousand Oaks Monday morning at about 1.15 a.m., according to a statement from Captain Garo Koregian. So, um, well, I guess you could be a captain and also be the spokesperson. We don't have any additional information at this point that we're releasing, Koregian told SCV News. Our major crimes investigators are going over the interviews and following up on the evidence they obtained at the scene. It's considered a very active investigation. I think it's reasonable to question just, okay, like, you know, these articles are coming out a few days after the occurrence. If there's no one on the loose, why isn't there an arrest? Like, I think it's... It makes sense that the public's going to be wondering about that condition, um, but they're keeping it close to the vest at this point. Eyewitnesses told the Thousand Oaks Acorn that they saw a bloody female being rolled away from the apartment after the incident. Omelia was a graduate of uh, Cal State Chico um, and was pursuing a career in accounting, which we mentioned. He was an accountant at Disabentino CPA in Camarillo at the time of his death. He had joined the firm in September of 2017, just after receiving his bachelor's degree in accounting from California State University, Chico. He was pursuing his certification as a public accountant and was an avid fan of boxing. While attending CSU Chico from May 2014 to May 2015, Amelia was a member of the Sigma New International Fraternity and he served as its treasurer. Um, there's a bunch more detail about him basically pulling them out of debt. It's kind of one of his early credits, I think, that he used to help get his jobs in terms of accounting. Uh, he was also an act, he was active in his community as a frat member. He volunteered at the Chico Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, walks for breast cancer, picking up trash, and more. Um, definitely just seems like a guy that was a good citizen and also being kind of smart about his early life and really getting some accolades there that people would notice and would helpfully help open some doors for him. And it, it seemed to be working. I mean, this guy is hitting the track that he wants in his life. And then for some reason, this happens. So I'm sure some of you probably figured it out already, but the woman that was removed, um, who it looks like had been attacked also, is actually the suspect in this case. Woman arrested on suspicion of murdering Chad Amelia. Bryn P. Spetcher, 27 years old, a Thousand Oaks resident and audiologist, was arrested at a local hospital for the May 28th stabbing death of Omelia. Omelia died of multiple stab wounds sustained during an altercation in the early morning hours of Memorial Day uh, inside his apartment. Spetcher and Omelia had been involved in a dating relationship. Now, there's several different articles, and I just didn't want to step you guys through all the variations in the story here. There was early articles where some of Bryn's family was saying that this was very casual. I don't even think it was romantic. Um, there was one article that even suggested maybe he had tried to press things and she was defending herself. And that's what happened in this instance. I don't think that's the case. That's why I'm not diving into that stuff too much. Um, but it seemed pretty clear that they are actually in a dating relationship. Bryn's going to admit to that um, very clearly in one way. Um, but something interesting to point out, they had only really been seeing each other for a matter of weeks, like maybe a month, somewhere around there. Very, very young budding relationship. So what exactly happened? How did things go from that to one of them being dead and the other one having wounds all over her. I mean, you can see in this picture, in the booking photo, she still has very severe wounds all, all over her. Uh, Specher had been hospitalized since the homicide to receive treatment for self-inflicted stab wounds. 
She was released from the hospital and booked into the pretrial detention facility on murder charges. Her bail set at $500,000. Once again, it's noting that she's an audiologist. She was working at the House Children's Hearing Center at UCLA. From what I understand, I believe her license to practice has been suspended at this point. She earned her Doctor of Audiology degree from the St. Louis's Washington University School of Medicine in 2017. Both these people just highly intelligent, um, both with impressive degrees. It, it's just this story, how does this happen? How does this happen? Uh, for people that don't know, an audiologist is a healthcare professional who identifies, assesses, and manages disorders of hearing, balance, and other neural systems. And Bryn would actually have a bit of a passion for that for a very personal reason. In a video posted on the school's Facebook page, Specher, who was diagnosed with hearing loss at age three, talks about her childhood. It was difficult to try and be normal because I didn't want to be the only one with hearing loss, she said about her youth. It was really hard for me to advocate for myself and be open about having hearing loss. I was very involved in sports and music and trying to get good grades in classes. I wanted to blend in with everybody else. A member of the American Academy of Audiology and the American Speech Language Hearing Association, her specialties include adult and pediatric diagnostics, auditory brainstem response testing, hearing aids, and cochlear implants. So can we piece together what happened in the apartment that night? Let's step through several articles here, and I've tried to stitch together at least as much of the narrative as became public through the press on this. Over at abc7.com, Omelia was stabbed multiple times, according to police, during an altercation between the pair. One of the questions I have in this thing is, what is the altercation stemming from? And quite honestly, I, I don't think we're going to have that answered by the end of this video. But when I'm hearing about occurrences like this, I'm always curious about, okay, like, was this an argument about where they had gone for dinner? Like, what type of argument was this? And trying to keep in mind that this is a very young relationship. They've only been seeing each other for a matter of weeks. Like this isn't going to be some argument about, hey, you didn't pay the mortgage on time or something like that. Uh, and even I'm not suggesting that that level of argument is worth any mode of violence, but I'm just saying the types of conversations and arguments you're going to have very early on in a relationship, they're going to be quite a bit different. And I just don't know what would be have that much fire to actually bring an outcome like this. Neighbors said that they heard some kind of problem before hearing screams coming from the apartment, arguing, people, commotion, then it kind of stopped a little bit, and then I heard it go on, and then I heard a woman screaming, a neighbor said. Now, we don't have a solid time frame here, but that description, I think, tells us that this was ongoing for a little bit. And I don't know, that could be a matter of minutes. It could be half an hour. We, we really have no sense of, of that in terms of timing. But with how they're describing there's commotion, then it stops, then it goes on, and then there's a woman screaming. I would, in my mind, that's suggesting at least minutes. Um, and I, th I do think that time is important in this case. And I think you guys will agree with me once we get to this, but uh, roommate recalls Memorial Day slang. So one of the roommates did wind up speaking to the press. Uh, his name is Vinny Oliveira. And let's see what he had to say about May 28th. According to Oliveira, Specher and Omelia were hanging out at Casa de Oaks the night of May 28th, Memorial Day, when Oliveira arrived home from work around 10.30 p.m. After going upstairs to take a shower, Oliveira laid down in bed and began to play on his phone. That's when he began hearing noises from downstairs and someone saying, get off me. I thought it was just a normal night, he said. I thought they were just playing around. But when he began hearing the things break, he decided to see what was going on. At the top of the stairs, he noticed something unusual. First thing I see is both Amelia and Specter's dogs together in the landing area, he said. They looked really scared. Uh, from what I understand, Amelia and Specter actually met each other at a dog park. They both have dogs that they love very much. Um, some people might question that with one of the details that's coming up. But when he proceeded down the stairs, Oliveira saw that furniture was toppled. 
The couch was flipped over and covered with blood, and Amelia was severely wounded, he said. There was a hole where his heart is, with blood everywhere. He looked at me and said, Vinny, Vinny, please help me. She stabbed me. Meanwhile, Specher, Oliveira recalled, looked at him with what he described as a blank stare. She was still holding the knife, he said. I said, Bryn, what the are you doing? Bryn, what's going on? Oliveira said that he ran back to his room and grabbed his cell phone and called 911 as he did, which he ran back downstairs. In my head, the only chance I had at saving Chad was to call the police, he said. I feared for his life and my life too. By the time Oliveira ran past the couple to an open door, he said that Amelia had fallen to the ground, but Specher was still stabbing him. So we literally have, I mean, if the rest already wasn't a strong enough eyewitness, he knows they're downstairs. He hears this scuffle. He goes down. He sees his friend. His friend says, I've been stabbed. She's holding the knife. On top of all that, he actually witnesses her go back to attack. And once again, I just want to keep this context in mind of timing. So there's there's time that's passing during this. There was there was an attack. He goes down. I would assume she had stopped the attack for a moment because she looks at him. He goes back up, grabs his phone. The attack resumes. Uh, after that, he doesn't know what happened inside the condo. Though after police arrived minutes later, he did hear their stun guns go off a few times. So now we have law enforcement show up and we get some of their perspective from Captain Corregian. When she saw the deputies, she turned the knife on herself. The sheriff's department spokesperson said that Specher was not immediately cooperative and deputies had to use non-lethal force to disarm her and take her into custody. A witness at the scene said he heard police use a taser. Once she's released from the hospital, she'll be booked into the pretrial detention facility with her bail set at 500000 police said. Corregian said two of Omelia's roommates witnessed what the captain described as a chaotic and violent event. So it sounds like the other roommate, uh, though I haven't seen him speak anywhere in press, uh, also is a witness to this in some way. The men have been cooperative with police. Fortunately, any type of murder in our areas is very unusual, Corregian said. The circumstances and violence associated with this is what makes it stick out the most. Um, in several of these articles, they a lot of them mention the other murder that happened that year or other murders that happened in previous years. And in most of them, they're kind of domestic violence related issues, um, which this seems to kind of fit in in terms of a categorization as well. Uh, whether drugs or alcohol played a role in the alleged murder is something investigators are looking at very closely, the captain said. So we get a pretty clear indicator there of what they're thinking might have been involved. But in terms of the restraint that Bryn actually put up, Thousand Oaks murder suspect Bryn Sprecher suffered a broken arm and wrist as a result of a blow from a sheriff deputy's baton the night of her arrest, the acorn has learned. So they they try to tase her. Um, it apparently wasn't enough and they couldn't disarm her and they had to use a baton and they wound up breaking her wrist. Police say the woman refused to drop the knife she was holding even after a hit from a 50,000 volt laser uh, taser. Now, I'm also hearing that there might have been actually two tasers, but we'll, we'll stick with what they're saying here. Um, and I don't know, you know, kids of the 80s, we would hear about PCP very frequently. Like PCP was this drug that if you took, like you could go nuts and you could think you were invincible and you could lift up a car, jump off a building, break all your bones, not realize it, keep running. Um, I haven't heard of a story like this in recent years in this way. And especially for this type of community with people this age and of this level of education, like there's all kinds of pieces to this. Like this is very, very unique on many, many fronts um, and scary. In, in all of those ways, but let's go ahead and continue with the big turn in this case. Boyfriend's T.O. killing blamed on bong smoke. So I was talking about PCP. Um, what we're talking about in this case seems to be marijuana, which is legal in California at this point. Um, 
I know in a lot of personal conversations I've had with people that use pot, the thought that someone would be violent off of being stoned is, uh, it's laughed at frequently. It's seen as kind of ridiculous. Uh, I have looked into it a lot. I've got a couple sources we'll touch on here. And there does seem to be some newer research now that we're finally kind of able to look at this thing on the up and up because, you know, back when it was illegal, there wasn't exactly the most resources being dedicated to studies and things like that. There are some big questions coming up about how THC can affect some people. Um, is that really what's going on in this case? Let's continue. A Thousand Oaks woman smoked from a bong and started hearing voices before she allegedly stabbed the man she had been dating, court testimony revealed Tuesday. The testimony was given in a preliminary hearing for Bryn Sprecher, a 28-year-old licensed audiologist charged in the May 28th killing of Chad O'Malia, 26. A judge found there was enough evidence for Sprecher to stand trial. She has pleaded not guilty to the murder of Amelia and denied a special allegation that she used a knife in the killing. Some of the early reports on these charges also mention possibly a charge about her hurting her dog. Um, it appears that she also attacked her dog when she was in this rage. And I did see some commenters, that, neighbors that were saying that they saw the dog being removed by police actually with a blanket. From what I understand, the dog is fine now, but, um, and I don't know if that charge still holds. I saw some mentions of it kind of in the early articles and in the later articles, I'm not seeing uh, mentions of that specific charge anymore, but let's learn more through this preliminary hearing about the details about the traumatic injuries that Chad went through. Um, and just try to keep in mind that we've got we've got a family trying to deal with this as well um, and feeling like they deserve justice. And it seems to me they certainly deserve justice. Wait until you hear these guys' details. But here's some details. At the preliminary hearing, hearing they had forensic scientists, the sheriff's deputies, and detectives testify about their efforts in the case. So we're going to get a, a much better understanding here. Ventura County Assistant Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Othan Menya conducted the autopsy on Omelia. He suffered dozens of stab wounds and incise wounds, which aren't as deep, and all were most likely from two different knives Menya testified. One of the knives was serrated, he said. There were 18 wounds on Omelia's head, including two stab wounds to the back of the head and other incise wounds on his face. Also, 27 incise wounds were found on his neck, 27 wounds on his neck alone. Four of them were stab wounds that damaged his trachea, jugular vein, and his carotid artery. Mania said he found 21 incised wounds and 13 stab wounds to the torso, shoulders, chest, and back. Some of the wounds involved the victim's lungs and heart. The heart was perforated twice, he said. Omelia suffered a stab wound to his right knee and injuries to his arms, including multiple defensive wounds to his hands. 108 wounds and two weapons two different knives being used we have some interaction with the roommates i'm just this to think of the nightmare that chad is going through during this period of time like how long is this attack going on for 108 and eight wounds are we talking a matter of minutes even if it was all focused into into one event what how how many could you do possibly two of those wounds per second we're talking a minute and a half two minutes three minutes how long did this go on and i'm just wondering where's where's the possibility for someone to snap out of whatever they're in or i mean what type of break in reality is this from bong smoke like if we're just talking THC, was there something else in the pipe? We're going to hear some more details from Bryn's point of view on this. But 108 stab wounds. I think you can understand why Chad's family and friends are looking for justice as, as strongly as they are. Is there... You know, if this was a self-defense, I'm pretty sure the phrasing that we've been hearing around Bryn's wounds 
law enforcement is saying those were self-inflicted and law enforcement seemed to have been there when those wounds happened. So it seems like we also have a witness from that. So this doesn't seem to be a situation where she was having to defend herself. But let's let's see what she did say. Let's get to the sergeant's testimony. Sergeant Stephen Jenkins, one of the detectives who interviewed Spetcher about the incident, said that he spoke with her a few times while she was at Los Robles Regional Medical Center. She was not under arrest or in police custody at that time. And she decided to speak with the detectives. Uh, she was arrested at the hospital on May 31st. She was read her rights. But even with that, she continued the interview. So it seems like she's being pretty open about her perspective on this. What does she say happened? Uh, Specialist defense attorney asked whether the sergeant knew if the defendant was on pain medication. The sergeant said that Specialist did not show symptoms of being impaired by pain medication. I'm sure she was on pain medication. She's got a broken wrist. She's got the numerous wounds we've seen to her face and neck. Um, you could probably assume that she was going to be on pain medication, but does, does that mean that the detective shouldn't interview her? Um, I, I, I don't know. The sergeant said that Specialist told him that she had met Amelia at a dog park in late April or early May. Once again, a matter of weeks here. They had hung out several times since then, and they had sex three or four times. So very clearly, they were in an intimate relationship here. Specher hung out with her friends on May 27th and later took her Siberian Husky named Araya to Omelia's condominium to hang out again. She got there between 10 and 10.30 p.m. Now, I know we're talking about people in their, their mid-20s here, but you know, showing up at 10 to 10 30 at night that once again suggests to me that this is um this is probably a dating relationship and i, I just want to get that out there because there was there was some other press that seemed to be kicking around that you know they they weren't really in that type of relationship it seems like it to me and we have her telling the detective here yes we were intimate with each other at one point amelia went out to the porch to smoke marijuana out of a bong and special went with him I think it's important that it's phrased that way. He's going out there because he wants to have a couple hits. She decides, I believe there's probably a decision. I don't think he dragged her out there. Uh, on top of that, the sergeant testifies she wanted to try some. So we have her making these decisions. Special allegedly told the sergeant she didn't feel the effects of the marijuana. And she told Amelia about that. Now, I'm seeing different phrasing around some of this. I saw one article, I, I'm not sure, I can't recall the source off the top of my head, but they almost made it seem like there was some type of disagreement about this. Like she was getting upset at the fact that he was able to feel high and she wasn't. Now that's not what this particular article is saying, but I've, I've read that in another place. So I just kind of want to throw that out there because quite honestly, I'm just curious about where does this turn into a disagreement? What is the topic that this, you know, escalates things to, to this level. Omelia lit the bong and he filled it with white smoke and Specher inhaled, according to the testimony. She didn't feel well after that. And she went to the bathroom, the sergeant testified. She said her vision was blurry. She couldn't breathe and felt like she was going to vomit, the sergeant testified. She made her way back to the couch and Omelia gave her bottles of water she told him to stay with her and stay awake because she believed she was dying, the sergeant testified. She felt that from the drugs he gave her, she died. So it seems like at this point, we're now getting into that break from reality. She believes that she's going to die. Maybe she's upset because he decides he's going to fall asleep or he's done for the night. I don't know. Um, but the sergeant says that she told him she felt that from the drugs, she actually did die. She had a vision that she was dead and voices were telling her to keep fighting and she'd come out of it. At one point, she threw a chair in between her and Omelia, but never mentioned anything about him attacking her, the sergeant said. In the police interview, she described throwing knives and having one in her hand, according to the testimony. The voices also told her to start hurting herself, the sergeant testified. On cross-examination, Specialist's attorney asked the sergeant if she ever talked about why she threw the chair or why she wanted to keep Amelia away from her. The sergeant testified that she described a lot of anger and wanting to keep the victim away. I wish we had more description on 
on what that anger is because I, I think their line of questioning is important. They're trying to kind of get to, okay, yes, there was this attack that none of us can understand, but there's these other steps kind of leading up to it. And we're not quite sure we understand those as well. Like, why are you going to throw this chair uh, at him? And especially if they ask, did he attack you at any, any point? And she says, no. Uh, Specher's attorney also asked if his client talked about whether she knew during the alleged murder what she was doing was wrong. The sergeant said he could not clarify whether she knew in the moment that it was wrong or if it is what she said later when speaking with authorities. Oh. So I couldn't look into this case without thinking of Reefer Madness. This is an old film. Um, it, it originally came out, it was 1936, an exploitation film about drugs revolving around the melodramatic events that ensue when high school students are lured by pushers to try marijuana. Upon trying it, they become addicted, eventually leading them to become involved in various crimes, such as a hit and run accident, manslaughter, murder, um, conspiracy to murder, and attempted rape. All while this is happening, they suffer hallucinations descending into insanity. It was originally called Tell Your Children. It was intended to be a morality tale, something that parents were supposed to show to their kids to get them to not specifically smoke marijuana. In the 1970s, this film was rediscovered and it gained new life as an unintentional satire among advocates of cannabis policy reform. Critics have called it one of the worst films ever made. I bring it up because... My understanding, I have not watched this movie, but my understanding about why it was so laughable was once again, that kind of common understanding that it seems like many of us have that you don't smoke weed and then act like you've just done a bunch of PCP and something, you know, that we had to watch out for as children of the eighties with the dare programs and all that stuff that were constantly being launched at us in schools was, uh, you can't just trust smoking weed cause you might smoke weed that does have PCP in it. Um, so I do think it's important to keep that in mind with this. There seems to be the possibility. Maybe there was something else. Maybe there was something else in the pipe. Are we going to find that in the tests? We'll get to that. But it's also got me wondering about the mentality of reefer madness. I mean, this thing was only made because there was a belief structure and it's just making me think if it is true, if this is Bryn's first time trying this, does she think that that is a reasonable, uh, not an alibi, but a reasonable defense in some way that it, it just, she got so thwacked by having her first few hits of marijuana that she broke from reality is reefer madness essentially going to be used as a legal defense in this case. And of course that question, um, is there something else at play? Was there some other drug that maybe was part of this? Now let's dive in just a little bit. Um, I just want to touch on the aspect of psychosis and marijuana. Uh, from what I can see, I'm finding a lot of studies that are kind of looking into this, especially in recent years. And there does seem to be a correlation of people that might, who might be prone for types of psychosis or people that have previous disorders, that those might be exacerbated by marijuana use. Uh, let's learn a little bit more here at the Child Mind Institute. A lot of people think smoking pot is not very dangerous for teenagers, but research shows that marijuana may be connected to mental health problems, especially disorders that involve psychosis. Starting young, smoking often, and smoking over a long period of time are big risk factors. And if the teen already has a mental health disorder, especially schizophrenia, smoking pot might make it worse. Now, I don't have the court transcripts. I'm not looking at this thing word for word, but um, the story that I'm hearing and what's being retold through the media is that Bryn was not an experienced pot smoker. She, she was not used to smoking marijuana. So this story, from my understanding of it at this point, is we have to believe it is, it is her first time she has had two separate hits off of that bong, and then this happens. Now, even this at the Child Mind Institute is saying, we're talking smoking over a period of time. People that are users, like habitual users in some way, are seeing 
this correlation with psychosis. I went looking every which way I could think of for someone that has never used marijuana to get before and on their first hit, they get thrown into a psychosis. I can't quite find something like that. I can't find anything that really hits that. The, the closest I could get is I do see mentions of intense use in terms of if, if you use a lot within one particular sitting, um, that that might, but that's also in the context of it being for someone that's kind of a regular user. I've never, I haven't been able to find the story that is, you know, it was my first time I tried it and I went nuts. Uh, it might be that young people who are prone to psychotic illness start smoking pot at a young age as a way to feel better, but it's also possible that smoking pot might trigger a disorder or make it worse. More research is needed for experts to understand these connections more fully. That statement is, I, I saw that time and time again in all these research papers that I was looking at. It was like, you know, we're, we've pulled this analysis together, but we need to look at this more. As a parent, just for any of you parents out there, the best thing you can do is not to scare or threaten your child, but to give them the facts, tell them that smoking pot once in a while is safer than regular or daily use, which could result in a psychotic illness. It's also important to note that if they have hallucinations while using pot, that could be a sign that they're prone to psychosis and they should stop smoking. One other thing I saw in my research on this is if people did have an elevation of their psychotic symptoms, from using pot when they stopped using it that subsided and if there was people that had a psychosis episode while using pot but they didn't have it happening before in their life once they stopped using pot they did not have those episodes again so if there is a correlation it does seem like if you stop using it you're going to be okay a report commissioned by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine cites evidence that heavy pot use, prolonged length of exposure, and age at the beginning of exposure may all be risk factors in triggering a first episode of psychosis. Where mental illness, especially schizophrenia, already exists, the report concludes heavy and prolonged pot use may make symptoms worse. So once again, I'm just highlighting this because the context of these conversations is really around heavy pot use, prolonged use, and that having some effect on psychosis. I just can't find that. I I had a hit and went nuts example to, to roll into this analysis. Um, back to the description of what happened. Omelia reloaded a clear glass bong, filled the chamber with thick smoke, Spesher told law enforcement, the sergeant told the court that the defendant said that hit is what led to her violent attack. So she's actually keying it down to one particular hit. She asked Mr. Amelia to stay with her and stay awake because she believed she was dying. Sergeant Stephen Jenkins testified. So now we get to it. Blood tests on the Chicago area native, that's Bryn Spetcher, uh, revealed the presence of marijuana only, according to the Sheriff's Crime Lab. An examination of the burned plant material remaining in the bong and the five grams of marijuana collected from Omelia's apartment also revealed no drugs beyond THC. There is no other drug that is a component of this, according to what we're being told through the press on this. In a letter sent to the court not long after Specher's arrest, Patricia Pierce of Bloomingdale, Illinois, the accused's grandmother, said that her granddaughter was incapable of such violence absent the influence of drugs. Now keep in mind, we're talking about her grandmother, kind of probably close to that age range of reefer madness being one of those things that was a much more common belief for her than maybe later generations. Former classmates from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis have said that Spetcher was not known to use drugs. Once again, pointing to this isn't someone that was a prolonged uh, pot user. A family member who spoke to the Acorn on terms of anonymity said that the fact that Spetcher grew up partially deaf made it so that she was shy and rarely dated. Patients who saw Spetcher during her short time in practice in Thousand Oaks have described her as a caring doctor who loved to show children who were hard of hearing how they could overcome their disability. Um, I feel terrible for, for both of these families. Um, 
but I don't understand the conditions of what's happening with, with this case. And I can't find another example that sheds more light on the possibility that, I don't know, like, it's just possible that this is her defense, that she made this story up in her head, that that was reasonable. But guys, I'm even struggling with that because what could this argument have been? They've been together for just a few weeks. Like what? If there's some argument that big, screw you. I don't want to see you anymore. And I'm out the door. Like, I don't, I don't know what could have elevated her to the point of this. And then we have kind of the other information about they tase her. She doesn't go down. They tell her, drop her weapon. She won't listen. It does seem that there was some form of psychosis going on here. Now, is that really caused from to in her story? She's saying it's that one specific hit that did it. I just, I've never seen anything like this before. Victim's father addresses court to express frustration with delays. Guys, I can't tell you how many different articles I had them queued up and we're already, I know this episode's running long, so I took them back out, but it was just extension after extension after extension. And yes, there was some things that happened. You know, this predates COVID, COVID happened. Um, then, you know, there was things like people had to wear masks in these court things. You have someone that's, that's hard of hearing that is the, the defendant in this. Um, so there was certainly some, some real issues that came into play that were already going to bring, uh, the trial to a halt in some ways. But on top of that, it seems like basically Bryn makes bail. So she's out and about doing her thing. There's even some articles that are pretty critical of her in terms of, you know, like several weeks later, it seems like she's on a family vacation and she has a, I think it's an Instagram for her dog and she's been visiting all these different places and making these posts, um, which, I mean, can you imagine being part of Chad's family and waiting for justice in this case and then hearing something like that or, or going to that Instagram, seeing those pictures um, you know, there she is three weeks after this and she's taking vacation somewhere. Chad isn't going to be able to take a vacation ever again. Um, I, I just imagine it's been infuriating, infuriating for the family. And really Chad's family has been very tight lipped in terms of media. They really haven't been talking to the media much at all. His dad started talking just a little bit around this, around the delays. Um, and his dad actually makes a really interesting point about Bryn had public defenders to start with and then basically fires them. And then her, I don't know if her family's paying for it, but somehow she, she has counsel hired for her that comes on and starts working. Um, Chad's family doesn't get that choice. Like they're stuck with the public, the public prosecutors one way or the other. There's nothing they can do to like, hey, we want our lawyers to be working on this. This this is a criminal case. Um, it's a really interesting thing to keep in mind as we get into some of the challenges with what's happened here in the courtroom. But let's get to this article from 2021. This Christmas will be the fourth that the O'Malia family has spent without their son and brother, a grieving father, told a Ventura County judge last week. If that wasn't bad enough, um, Chad's mother also died somewhere around 18 months after his death. And his father is convinced it's from a broken heart. It's just from her not being able to, to handle what happened around this. Sean O'Malia exercised his right to address the court December 14th for the first time since the slaying of his son. He was moved to speak after attorneys for the defendant, um, filed another request to delay the proceedings. Amelia asked the judge to bring the three and a half year old case to trial as soon as possible, the lead prosecutor said. Now, as some delays do happen, they actually kind of happen in both directions. The prosecution also brought up something and that kind of caused a delay in itself. Let's learn about that. The county wants a doctor to administer a MMPI-2 psychological test, better known as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It involves over 560 true or false questions and is the most widely used and research clinical assessment tool to help diagnose mental health disorders. The defense is trying to limit our expert, said prosecutor Audrey Nafziger. 
Uh, Specher's attorneys couldn't be reached for comment. Regardless of the judge's ruling, the state expects their witness to examine Specher sometime between December and January, leaving February open as a possible trial start date. That, that certainly did not happen. The victim's father, Sean O'Malia, has addressed the court twice over the past year to express his frustration with the pace of the proceedings. But now we have his side, the prosecutor, saying, hey, we want this Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory run. Um, I don't know exactly what they were going for the, in that, unless they were trying to identify that there was some type of psychological disorder that she was already dealing with. Um, was there some precedent for her to understand that? Would that have helped their prosecution in some way? Like if she knew, uh, you know, I yes, I deal with psychosis of some kind, I probably shouldn't try hitting that bong or i probably shouldn't try that level of narcotics I, I i just i don't know exactly where the prosecutors were going with this the defense didn't want it either so it's kind of weird especially with how it all plays out let's get to that next step here so they do have their hearing at the december 8th hearing Specher's attorney robert schwartz argued against the need for psychological testing saying his client has no mental illness, and that her actions on that day were induced by drugs. So they are specifically pointing to the drugs, but not only pointing to the drugs, and another thing that's kind of a slap towards the victim and his family, and something I don't really appreciate, the drugs that were provided by the victim. And that's what resulted in transient psychosis. So a psychosis that just came and went, apparently. Um, I'm it's tough for me to think of that situation to think of someone saying, Hey, I want to try that. You're going out and, you know, smoking, having a couple of hits off a bong. I'd like to try that. And then having that attorney blame that person. Well, that person provided it. So they're responsible for what happened. It's, are they, I don't know. Cause I think a lot more bars would be closed off of people's DUIs and injuries that happened to others resulting to that. I'm just, Anyway, uh, Specher stabbed Omelia over 100 times with a kitchen blade after the two smoked cannabis using a bong. Lab testing showed no other substances beyond alcohol and THC. Now, that's a little bit of a twist. One of the studies that I ran into was actually comparing alcohol and THC to see which is more, which makes people more violent. And the results of that study were very strong that alcohol certainly did and THC really did not. And as it did kind of in that particular study did kind of have the same outcome that most of us assume that, that people generally are less prone to violence when they're high. That study did head that conclusion, but for alcohol, they noted that the violence actually escalated. So at this point now, okay, we've got alcohol. That's a component here too. And I think all of us have had someone in our lives that we know, oh, that person shouldn't have tequila. That person shouldn't have whiskey. we I think all of us have seen that combo of a particular person with a very specific or particular type of alcohol that is a bad mix. Now that alcohol is part of this, I does that change it for me personally? It kind of does. Like the story of hey, it was my first two hits on a bong and all of a sudden I went nuts and attacked someone doesn't make nearly as much sense as I'm not a good drunk. I drank too much of that particular alcohol that sets me off. And then I had a couple hits and I just went loopy. Like then whose fault is it really? It really brings up like this kind of moral dilemma question for me in terms of like, let's say that I did some drug or something like that. And it completely blasted my mind, just sent me off the edge and I committed some terrible, horrible crime. Does that mean that I'm not responsible for it? Does it like, I don't, I personally don't think I believe that. I personally think that, well, I made the choice to do that. And even this aspect of, well, but it was given to you by someone else. Everything that we have here is everything I'm looking around my office right now seeing was given to me by someone else, or maybe I purchased it, but it still came from someone else. Is it their fault? Um, I don't know. I don't know about this defense, but 
Anyway, uh, Schwartz said that the state's only goal in testing Specher was to hurt her credibility. They're talking about the, um, the psychological test. And her credibility is crucial. Lead prosecutor Audrey Nafziger said that the testing was necessary to help paint a picture of Specher's mental state at the time of the homicide. And the judge sides with the prosecution, ordering Specher to submit to the psychological test. You would think that that should be a good thing. It's really interesting how this case goes. Just nothing goes as expected with this case. From the beginning, authorities have accused Bryn Specher, now 32 years old, of murder, defined as the unlawful killing of a human being in which the person had the specific intent to kill the victim or demonstrated a conscious disregard for human life. 108 stab wounds. I, th I think that's a disregard, but conscious is really the big question there. Since that time, there's been a change of guard both at the helm of the district attorney's office and in the prosecution of the case. The original charges were filed under the county's previous district attorney, Greg Toten, who left office in 2021. The original attorney representing the DA's office on the case, Catherine Volker, was elected to the county superior court in 2020. According to Sean O'Malia, the plans are to reduce the charge to involuntary manslaughter, which is causing someone's death through reckless behavior or in the commission of another crime, but without intent to kill. Murder carries a punishment of up to life in prison. The base sentence for involuntary manslaughter under federal sentencing guidelines is 10 to 16 months in prison. Omelia is not accepting the decision without a fight. Quote, a, few, a month before we go to trial, they tell me after five and a half years, they're going to lower charges. The family basically believes Chad is not getting justice. 10 to 16 months. Why did that change happen? because of something the prosecutors asked for. The change was prompted by the forensic psychologist's review on behalf of prosecutors. That review found that the woman became acutely psychotic after consuming marijuana, then stabbed the victim herself and her dog, according to the court filings. On Wednesday, the Ventura County District Attorney filed an amended charging document alleging Bryn Specher, now 32, committed involuntary manslaughter with the use of a knife. Prosecutors also filed several special allegations, including the crime involved great violence. The review, which included examination of body-worn camera video from the scene, noted Specher was described as appearing possessed, which is consistent with acute psychosis. The psychologist, Chris Mahandy, noted that Specher's stabbing of her own beloved dog without any evidence of animal cruelty tendencies is highly inconsistent with her love of dogs and underscores her level of impairment, according to the filing. I get that she's impaired. I just, I don't know how responsibility gets dropped. Like, if, if I was held down and someone injected me with something and then I went nuts... There, I feel like maybe there's some argument for that I was not responsible for that. Cannabis-induced psychotic disorder can develop shortly after a high dose and usually involves persecutory delusions, among other symptoms, the psychologist noted. I, I've looked every which way I can, and I can't find something that says off of one dose or off of a single usage. I Everything that I'm seeing is talking about cannabis-induced psychotic disorder in terms of heavy usage, prolonged periods of time, people with pre-existing conditions. Like it's, I, I don't know. I, I just, I can't find, if you guys find any examples of it, please include it uh, in the comments down below because I just can't find the example I'm looking for on that. Expert witnesses for the defense made similar findings the prosecution's document notes. Uh, so in Ventura County Superior Court, Specher pleaded not guilty to the involuntary manslaughter charge and denied the special allegations. A jury trial has been scheduled. I'm also curious about that. It's it's now down to her being in jail for maybe a year and she's still pleading not guilty despite the fact that she basically admitted to it and we've got witnesses. And is involuntary manslaughter really the right charge for this? 
I don't feel like it is personally. Uh, involuntary manslaughter is a type of manslaughter that refers to the act of a person acting carelessly or recklessly, leading to another person's death as a result. Could that be a fit for this situation? Maybe. But the examples I'm seeing here, uh, they don't seem to be a solid fit. This means that the person had no explicit intent to harm another human being. Some of the common examples include accidental firearm discharge, improper medication prescription, and I think that's basically to cover more doctors, unlicensed practice of medicine. Um, I don't know. These examples, just they're not lining up for me very strong. There is another charge that I'm really surprised the first degree murder charge I know is tough, uh, basically because of the premeditation, especially with what we're talking about on, on this case. Like if she's saying, you know, I went over there, everything was fine. I had a couple hits. All of a sudden I went nuts. Then premeditation is basically out the window. So I understand the first degree murder charge is going to be tricky in this case. Second degree murder, maybe not. Second degree murder is still a very serious crime. It's a step down in severity when compared to first degree. It's one that doesn't have any kind of premeditation and may have only been intended to cause harm rather than death. But even in that case, 108 stab wounds, it's clear that it was meant to cause death. Premeditation, if that's the big question on the, on the, on the table here, second degree murder doesn't need to have that. So why did the, pr the prosecution drop it down to such a low charge? I don't know. The other thing about second degree murder is the sentencing for it is still pretty stiff and can include up to life in prison, 15 years to life in prison for California. Why did that get skipped over? I very much understand the frustration that the family's having with this. And it's interesting because I found this clip I want to share with you guys real quick uh, of Sean, Chad's father, talking, and he does believe that she had a break from reality. And it, it seems like that's the only believable thing here. We could question the, was it the pot? Is alcohol possibly part of it? Is there some predisposition she has? Which, by the way, one of the things I did see for certain types of psychosis is challenging childhoods. And I it sounds like she probably had a challenging childhood. Um, but let's, let's hear it from Chad's father here. She was in some form of hallucination, but if you go through, you know, the different types of consciousness, that's one of them. She was not unconscious. She knew what she was doing and she was actually making choices. She acted with intent to kill somebody. We're in a place now that Audrey Knopfsinger, the deputy DA that's handling the case, She's gonna, by, by the action that she's taking, she's actually acquitting her of second degree murder with no trial. Just prosecute the crime for what it is. It's a murder. Nobody's, nobody's ever argued on the defense side that she didn't take a human life. This could be a very scary precedent, especially with how wide marijuana use is being adopted across all the states now. Is reefer madness going to literally be a legal defense? Is it going to be as simple as people saying, oh yeah, I had a hit, I went psychotic, and then going through a true or false, like, yes, I know it's 560 questions, but do you really think that someone that has the intent of misleading you into believing that they had a psychotic break wouldn't know how to pick the right side of a true or false question? I don't know. I'm kind of scared about the outcome on this as well. Uh, I'm sharing this video with you guys here today because this trial is supposed to start next Monday. Um, they're actually in jury selection this week. So we'll see what happens with this trial. Um, but I can tell you that Chad's father is a man that has already lost so much in the past five and a half years. And I don't know that it's right to think that the version of justice that he's going to get is maybe a handful of months and who knows how much of that she's going to actually wind up serving like it's um i don't know it makes me wonder about it i bet you guys have a lot to share on that too let's please talk about this in the comments down below and i just want to send a message to chad's family chad's friends 
that one friend in particular, thank you for reaching out to me, bringing this up. It's, it's got me stuck in terms of the morality, um, of this issue. Like thinking about what if it was true? What if it was really, really true that someone was just trying to have a good time and it was her first time trying it and she went nuts. Like I, I believe in second chances. I think that's one of the beautiful things about life. You guys hear me all the time on videos where we talk about young people that lose their lives. And I'm like, the biggest thing that sucks is they never get that second chance. They never get to learn from their mistakes. Um, is this matter that simple? I'm, I'm, I'm caught on it. Like I want to believe that I want to believe that there was some other force that was at control in that night that, that took things to this bizarre, hard to understand level. But even if there was, then the steps that lead up to it, those other little tiny decisions become even more important. And I believe that they require more scrutiny. And I don't know that that's happened in this case. I don't know why they dropped this as low as they did. Why didn't they go for a second degree? That's kind of the biggest question that I just, I can't answer. I don't understand it. Is this a matter of prosecutors being scared of, you know, you've got some new people in there and they just don't want losses on their record. Like, I, I don't know. Is that fair for these families? I, I don't, for both families, I don't know that that's fair. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, thank you guys for spending some time with me here today. I really appreciate each and every one of you that takes on these kind of deeper dives, sometimes with much harder issues and questions. I know I'll be thinking about this case for a long time and I'll be staying up to date on the developments with what happens in the courtroom. I will uh, no doubt have an update episode for you guys at the end of that trial and let you know how this all played out. So take care, have a nice weekend, and I will see you again here soon on the Lord and Arts channel.